All right, hello everyone. I think we are, I think we're getting going. So thanks for coming. Um, let me just start with the logistics. Um, while I am presenting, feel free to put questions in the q and I, um, I feel like I'm one of the few people in the world who is actually willing to admit that I'm really bad at multitasking. So um, <laughs> I, I may sort of, you know, stop every once in a while when I come to a stopping point and, and check on it um, and hopefully get to them eventually. Um, I am now going to share my screen. All right, so I should also say that um, in you know in our time frame, I can't go into great depth on everything. Um, so if I mention a topic or show a picture or you know sort of mention in passing something that you like more depth on, I can either try to cover it or um, I will be going over to the Discord channel afterwards so we can continue the discussion there if I, you know, if there are things I gloss over that you're interested in. All right, so my name is Anne Nidham and I'm going to be talking about medieval bestiaries. Um, I have to explain that I am not coming at this from the, um, as a, like a professional scholar of medieval history. I'm coming from the perspective of an artist, an author who, researches um, something that is really of interest to me because I love the unique way that bestiaries bring together art, science, morality, history, and fantasy. Uh, they really have some of everything and I get very excited about that. So I wrote and illustrated a fantasy bestiary with all this inspiration I was getting. Um, that's this, I will talk about that later, but let's start with the basics. What is a bestiary? Well, it's a book about animals. The genre was developed in the Middle Ages and reached its peak of popularity in Europe, especially England and France around the 12th through 14th century. In a bestiary, uh, each animal has um, a description of its appearance, where it lives, some details of its behavior and life cycle, and how it impacts humans. So whether it's dangerous or harmful in some way, whether it can be domesticated, how any parts of it might have medicinal or other uses, how to catch it and kill it and so on. There were a number of natural history encyclopedias in the classical era that included all this same sort of stuff, such as Aristotle in the fourth century before the common era, Pliny in the first century, Salinas in the third century. And those encyclopedias were attempts to collect together all current knowledge about the natural world and present it systematically. So they were a sort of proto-science. But as the medieval bestiary genre developed out of these earlier collections of information about animals, it made a couple of major changes. And I will get to the unique features of bestiaries in a bit, but first I wanna talk about the sorts of animals that were included in the bestiaries. So first of all, you get your ordinary creatures, such as dogs, hedgehogs, horses. And I wanna take a moment to consider the importance of animals in everyday life in the pre-modern era. People didn't just live with a beloved pet or two while all other animals were kept at a safe distance as it tends to be for us. They needed horses for transportation, oxen for plowing, dogs for hunting and herding. They lived next door to, and sometimes right together with all the cattle, goats, pigs, chickens they needed for food. Their clothes were made of wool from the sheep they raised. They used tools made from bone. The very pages of these bestiaries were parchment from animal skin written with quills from birds. They also had to deal with the dangers of wolves, the predations of foxes, rats and mice in the grain, fleas and lice, and on and on and on. One of my favorite hints at this comes from the word puce, you know, that sort of brownish maroonish color. It is technically defined as being the color of a louse engorged with blood. <laughs> so this was a world in which that was a color that everyone knew and recognized. Um, people were aware of the impact of animals on their lives in a way I think it can be hard for us to imagine, although of course we do imagine some of it in 
sci-fi fantasy set in pre-industrial or like post-apocalyptic worlds. At any rate, for the writers and readers of bestiaries, these were the animals they knew intimately. Okay, and then you have your exotic animals, such as lions and camels, beasts that uh, might be mentioned in the Bible or known by travelers, merchants, crusaders, or even kept in menageries by kings, but not seen by ordinary European people under ordinary circumstances. And there were even more exotic animals like elephants, crocodiles, creatures from India, and eventually as we get into the Renaissance, the creatures from the Americas. Um, and even some of these beasts did make it to Europe, including an elephant that was presented to Henry III of England in 1255. But still, most of these animals were gonna be utterly outside the experience of anyone who might be writing or illustrating or even the wealthy patrons reading one of these bestiaries. Okay, and then finally you have your animals that we now know to be fantasy. And this is the really fun stuff, right? So let's take a few minutes and savor them. Um, you all know about unicorn, dragon, phoenix, griffin, um, the sirens and centaurs and the hydra that were inspired by Greek and Roman mythology. These were all staples of the bestiaries um, and they were treated in, in those books just the same as the horses or the lions. The Pegasus, by the way, was not actually featured in most um, bestiaries. And you can see that this one looks a little different from our modern, our modern version. Um, and with this crowd, I'm sure a lot of you also already know some of the more generally unfamiliar creatures as well, but let me share a few fun ones. Um, the Citalis, for example, is a serpent that, um, it has such a gorgeous, colorful skin that its victims are literally stunned by its resplendent beauty and that's how it catches them. Um, and the Bonicon um, down here is basically medieval comic relief. Because its horns are too tightly curved to be useful for defense, it sprays burning caustic dung for a quarter mile behind it. So it's very uh, unsavory to catch. Or here are some more. The Parandrus here down at the bottom um, looks like a pretty ordinary goat or deer of some sort, but in fact, it can turn practically invisible by taking on the appearance of its surroundings. And the Caladrius is a bird that can tell whether a sick person will recover or die. So this king, uh, he may look awful, but he's one of the lucky ones. The Caladrius is facing toward him, which means it will draw his disease into itself and he, he's gonna live. If I haven't yet mentioned your favorite beast, don't worry, we will be seeing more. But all these sorts of animals, the ordinary, the exotic, and the completely fantastical, they were all mixed in together without distinction. And they were written up in bestiaries with that information about how they lived and how they impacted humans. So the information about the fantasy creatures was obviously sheer fantasy, but even many of the real animals um, included information that was equally fantastical. For example, bestiaries tell us that a crocodile always weeps after eating a man. And yes, that is a crocodile. Um, that bear cubs are born as shapeless lumps and have to be licked into shape by the mother bear and that the pelican revives her dead chicks by piercing her own breast and letting the blood flow over them. So where did all this information about all these animals come from? Well, seldom from direct observation, obviously. Of course, many of the creatures could never be directly observed by your average scholar at the time, but even the ordinary beasts like dogs and doves were not studied scientifically scientific study hadn't really been invented yet. Although there were some inklings of it. Some bestiaries stated that the lion is afraid of a white cock. And apparently this was tested empirically by at least two enterprising proto-scientists during the Middle Ages with exactly the results that we might expect. 
but their findings didn't change what was written in the bestiaries because the information was primarily simply recopied from past authorities, such as Aristotle and Pliny and the other classical encyclopedias, or it was extrapolated from the Bible and other religious works that happened to mention animals, or it was gleaned from travelers' tales describing what they saw in faraway lands. And then the various versions of bestiaries were recopied and passed around and copied again. The information was often unquestioned, but sometimes a writer is clearly dubious about a claim and includes it with a caveat. But then the next person to copy the information might leave out the uncertainties of the first one and present a dubious story as solid fact, which was then copied without question by the next author down the line. It's basically a game of telephone. So you get blind repetition and you also get information shifting and morphing from one copy of the book to the next if the copyist garbles something. Down at the bottom here, you can see that this second um, bestiary with its illustration and account of the basilisk was clearly copied just directly both picture and text from this slightly earlier one. So nowadays, when people see the fantastical creatures and other scientific inaccuracies in bestiaries, they tend to sneer at medieval people and say, well, how could they be so ignorant? How could they be so stupid? Couldn't they see that it wasn't true? Well, first of all, you have to remember that there was a lot of it that in fact, no, they couldn't see. People didn't think dragons and unicorns were any more fantastical than camels or elephants. They were all equally exotic, all equally unlikely ever to be seen by ordinary people. People had no possible way of knowing that a beast as big as a house with a trumpet for a nose was real, but a beast like a simple horse or goat with a single horn on its forehead was not. If anything, the unicorn seems more plausible, right? Especially when there was equal physical proof of both in the form of elephant tusks and unicorn horns which as it turns out were really narwhal tusks, but again, how could they know that? Another source of fantastical animals or their fantastical traits are attempts to describe unfamiliar real beasts. So for example, it's often suggested that the unicorn developed out of descriptions of the rhinoceros, perhaps muddled up with the oryx or some other antelope. The basilisk may have been born from reports of cobras, which do have sort of a crown if you think about it. And the idea that their deadly stare, um, the idea of the deadly stare might come from spitting cobras, which shoot venom into their victim's eyes. Now the parandrus, which I just mentioned before with its chameleon-like ability to disguise itself, um, that might be an over-enthusiastic interpretation of descriptions of reindeer which change color seasonally to blend with their environment. Although later writers then changed the place and started putting the parandrus in Ethiopia, which obviously doesn't fit so well with being a reindeer, but, um, or imagine if someone described something like a sort of big fish, but with huge shields on its front and back and four feet, or even wilder, a plant that grows tiny balls of wool, just like lamb's wool. So what's an illustrator to make of such a description, right? Their attempts sometimes really aren't as crazy as they first seem. It's important to remember that medieval people weren't any stupider than we are. <laughs> they just had limited information and a different way of viewing the world. So now this is the point where it's time to tell you about one of the major characteristics that defines the bestiary genre. So unlike other previous encyclopedias of animals. The bestiaries take all this information about the creatures and draw from it symbolism and moral lessons for how we should understand and live our lives. In the 13th century, theologian Thomas Chobham wrote, the Lord created different creatures with different natures, not only for the sustenance of men, but also for their instruction so that through the same creature, we may contemplate not only what may be useful in the body, but also what may be useful in the soul. For the whole world is full of different creatures 
like a manuscript full of different letters and sentences and their meanings. So the logic goes, nature was made by the creator to contain lessons for humanity. And the point of studying nature is what you can learn from it. And if you can learn something valuable from it, who cares whether it really exists or not? Let's take a modern example. Everyone knows what it means if I say someone walks duck footed, right? With your feet pointing out. And how many of you have ever seen an actual duck in real life? Probably most of you. Right, and if you observe a duck, anyone can see that it is not scientifically true that ducks walk with their feet splayed outwards. In fact, it's the opposite, but we don't care because duck-footed offers us a useful metaphor or image that everyone understands, and we don't pay that much attention to the details of reality in this context. Well, that's what the medieval bestiaries were doing. They were giving people useful symbols that stood for important moral or theological lessons, and they didn't worry about whether the knowledge they were imparting was true in what we now think of as the scientific sense, as long as they believed that it was true in this mythic moral sense. And I wanna tie this in with what speculative fiction can do. Um, it can say, don't worry about whether or not this story is realistic. Let's just see where it takes us and explore these big questions about how we can live our lives. I do wanna take just a moment to talk about the sorts of moral lessons that the medieval bestiaries tended to teach. So for the most part, they were very much about medieval Catholic Christian theology. For example, one of the facts about lions is that their cubs are born dead and that after three days, the father lion breathes life into them. So this clearly symbolized Christ being resurrected three days after the crucifixion. We also learn that whales are so big resting at the surface of the ocean that sailors mistake the, land, the, the whales back for an island. And if they disembark and light a fire on it, it dives down and drowns them all. And from this, we are reminded that Satan's wiles lure people to their doom with false appearances. We saw before how the pelican pierces its breast to revive its chicks with blood, and maybe you can see where this is going. We are taught from the pelican how Christ sacrificed his own blood to bring new life to us, his chicks. So, bestiaries were enormously popular in Christian Europe, probably second only to the Bible in how many versions were written and how many languages they were translated into. However, the bestiary concept the idea of collecting information and stories about animals and using them to represent important truths. That concept was not confined to Christian Europe, but was also popular throughout the Middle East and Northern Africa, as well as areas of Persian influence. There were numerous Arabic versions of bestiaries and Hebrew art and literature also made use of animals to symbolize and teach spiritual truths in similar ways. So here's an Iranian illumination of the mountain goat or ibex, illustrating how when it falls, it lands on its horns, which are so strong that they break the fall so that it can land unharmed. That was a fact <laughs> common among bestiaries in Christian Europe as well. We have the same information shared back and forth and believed widely between these sort of different but related cultures. But the moral glosses with their theological focus don't always translate so well. So I mentioned before how the father lion breathing life into its cubs was interpreted by Christians as a symbol of Christ's resurrection, right? But here we see the same animal imagery in a Hebrew Bible where clearly the audience would not have drawn the same moral teaching from it. So here it illustrates the passage in Genesis where God commands Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. And according to some rabbinic commentaries, Abraham actually did kill Isaac and then Isaac was miraculously brought back to life. So for a medieval Jewish audience, that's what this bestiary image would have illustrated. The same animal facts and imagery were used in similar ways 
all across these regions, even though they had to have a different allegorical twist for the different religious beliefs. I also want to just share with you um, a few of the fantastical creatures that appear regularly in Arabic bestiaries, but not European ones. And I know relatively little about these since I can't read Arabic, but I can tell you that this Ceranus uses his nose for a flute, and these dots are, are the holes to modulate the pitch. And the Sanaja is described as being a fabulous beast of Tibet. And this great bird clearly has some relationship with the rock of, you know, a lot of Arabian folklore. Um, so some something in that tradition, although this one looks more like a stork than an, than an eagle of some sort. All right, at any rate, that's what the writing in bestiaries was all about. But to get back to Europe, only about five to 10% of the European population was literate during this period. So you might think that none of this is really gonna have much impact. In fact, however, the percentage of the population that was exposed to the information and the iconography of bestiaries through sermons, art in churches and other public buildings, oral transmission and so on was much higher, probably nearly universal. In fact, you can think of bestiary animals as medieval memes, right? An image or an animal could appear anywhere, carved on the end of a pew, engraved on a necklace, painted on a pottery bowl, and it wasn't merely decorative, although certainly medieval artists did have a love of rich decoration. But the image of bestiary animal would instantly remind you of its meaning or meanings, multiple meanings. They were not always totally simple and straightforward. But so example, the lamb would remind you of Jesus Christ, um, the pelican in her piety, which we have heard about a couple of times already. Um, the dragon is gonna remind you to watch out for, for Satan's wiles and so forth. It's worth mentioning how this ties in with heraldry in demonstrating and reinforcing that whole mindset of symbolism. Heraldry was developing at the same time that bestiaries were becoming popular. And by the end of the 14th century, there were books of animal symbols that you could use to select your heraldic emblem, like a catalog. So heraldry and other secular uses broadened and added to the use of various symbols, particularly adding secular meanings. And then the secular uses of the symbols contributed to keeping them alive and in common use. Consider the extent to which many of these symbols are still part of our culture today, six or seven centuries later. The lion as king of the beasts, the swan that sings its song right before it dies, the craftiness of foxes, although that has, you know, even older roots, um, crocodile tears, even the idea that elephants are afraid of mice. I think this also explains some of the differences in popularity between the various fantastical creatures nowadays. Like every toddler knows all about dragons and unicorns, while hardly anyone's ever heard of a Sarah or a Lucrota. In general, the mythical beasts that have really worked their way into the heart of the culture are those that had the most popular, widely referenced bestiary stories associated with them. So the bestiaries deeply influenced the fantasy landscape that we inherited. This little guy, he's not even a real actual animal, this marginal monster at the bottom. Um, he's just awesome. <laughs> It's just for a doodle for decoration. Okay, a second unique and distinctive feature of bestiaries was the illustrations. So those earlier natural histories of the classical era were not illustrated. But as the genre developed into the bestiaries of the Middle Ages, illustrations and their iconography became a key element. So let's take a closer look at the art that was found in these bestiaries because it really includes good, bad, and ugly, and they're all really fun. So here's a selection of bestiary illuminations, all of Griffin's obviously, and you can see from these examples that there isn't too wide a variation in the iconography, which is the way they're portrayed. But there is a huge variation in the skill of the artists, the level of detail, the richness of the materials, and so on. Some are really beautiful little works of art, some not so much. 
So just as with the writing, scientific accuracy was not a priority in bestiary illustration. Again, it's a combination of factors. Some of the creatures, in, including the griffins, obviously, were ones that the artist could not possibly have seen for him or herself. But even known animals were probably not drawn for, from direct observation. Interestingly, you, you get a lot of bestiary illustrations that are quite crude or inaccurate at the same time as you find marginal illustrations in other books, like Books of Hours and Psalters, that are incredibly beautifully observed and portrayed. So it's not that artists were incapable of making art from accurate observation, it's just that they didn't necessarily do it for bestiaries. And one reason for that is that the point was not to show people a familiar, realistic version of what they already knew in the ordinary world, but rather to inspire them with a vision of a more mysterious spiritual world from which they could learn all these spiritual truths. So we often see animals painted in crazy colors. And you know this may have been just partly aesthetic, just to make the pictures brighter and more beautiful and to keep the artists from you know, getting so bored. But the colors were also used to emphasize just how exotic and wondrous something was in its role of representing spiritual truths. So it's worth pointing out that there's another connection here with speculative fiction now. Now, to be clear, in the medieval world, griffins and dragons and all were not viewed as fantasy in the same way we think of it now. But I'm talking about this deeper idea that you can show people things that are explicitly not ordinary everyday things and draw them in, draw people in with wonder and curiosity, and then use this sense of wonder to get people to think about and explore philosophical and moral ideas. So just to hold that thought because I'm gonna get back to it. So at first these bestiary illustrations were all hand-drawn and painted, obviously because the entirety of all books at the time were made by hand. But with the invention of the printing press in Europe in about 1450, bestiaries, which by this time were beginning to morph back into encyclopedias of natural history, were among the first books to be printed and widely spread. The illustrations of printed books were made from wood blocks. When the ink is spread onto the surface of the carved block, it does not go down into the carved area. So every part that is carved will be white, and every part that's uncarved will receive the ink and be printed in black. It's very laborious to carve the block, but once it's made, it can be used to print hundreds and hundreds of copies. So handwritten and illuminated books continued to be made for at least a century after the invention of the printing press because they were considered to be much higher quality more beautiful luxury items. But I'm particularly fond of the early printed books because block printing is the medium I use for my own artwork. Um, I use primarily rubber blocks rather than wood blocks, but the principle and process is exactly the same. And block printed pictures of animals illustrate the final bend of the arc as the bestiary eventually sort of blended into Renaissance attempts at natural science in the 15th century. You can see the shift in that the animals in earlier bestiaries were arranged according to medieval symbolism, often starting with the lion as king of the beasts, while the later encyclopedias were arranged according to the Renaissance logic of alphabetical order. The symbolism and the moralizing was tended to be gradually removed to leave only the facts, although past authorities continued to be largely unquestioned for a while longer. And some of the dubious facts and the mythical creatures remained in encyclopedias for at least another century. So here's a case study of the salamander as it appears in bestiaries. According to the classical authors, dutifully followed then by the medieval bestiaries. Salamanders are so poisonous that if they climb a tree, they can poison all the fruit. And if they go into a well, like this one, they can poison the water. But also, um, they, and they, they, they live in fire. 
they're so cold that they can put the fire out, but they also can actually draw their sustenance from living in the flame. So you can see that all these depictions <laughs> have not only nothing to do with the real amphibian salamanders, but that about the only thing they have in common with each other in terms of physical appearance is the fire. Some salamanders are depicted with no legs. Some have two or four or six <laughs> or wings. Um, but I've arranged these samples here chronologically. So in the bottom row here, we get to the printed books that are beginning to move toward trying to be scientific. You can see that this salamander from 1491 is still pretty bizarre with its pig snout. And in the early 16th century, the alchemist Paracelsus named the salamander as the elemental spirit of fire. So clearly the salamander wasn't wholly out of fire yet. But this one, which is found in a travelogue, it isn't so bad, except that it seems to be furry and it does have ears. And then finally, these two are both from um, a 1551 book by Conrad Gesner. And the first one is clearly just copied from the one before, but significantly it is labeled false picture of a salamander. And then the second one is really pretty accurate at last. So now the various ideas about the salamander have been disentangled and separated into the real amphibian that Gesner was trying to describe down here. And that mythical creature, with, elemental with its fiery attributes. So I included the magical salamander as one of the fantastical creatures in my book. And this last one here is my version. And that brings us to the present. I love the fantasy creatures in bestiaries. I love the illuminations. I love the block prints in the printed versions. And I love the idea of trying to think about like what moral lessons you can learn from the things you see and imagine and the stories you hear. So pulling all these pieces together, I wanted to make my own bestiary. I included exclusively fantastical creatures in mind because fantasy allows you that freedom to tell the story however you want, since everyone already knows it isn't scientific or real. As I alluded to earlier, speculative fiction invites us to consider different ways things could be instead of sticking to what conventional wisdom assures us must be realistic. Fantasy and sci-fi ask up, what if? and thereby allow and encourage us to think in new ways, right? I wanted to use the telling of fantasy stories about fantastical creatures to invite my readers to curiosity and wonder, and then through curiosity and wonder, to be open to imagining a wider range of possibilities of how we might live. I illustrated my best Jerry with block prints, you can see some of the process in these pictures. I should put in a plug that I am doing a demo tomorrow at four on the Discord art demo channel, um, if that works out. Um, and as for the animals in my bestiary, I definitely put my own spin on them. So for example, wyverns appear most commonly in heraldry. So I made my wyvern escaping from its heraldic shield. Uh, another Latin name that the bestiaries give for that island whale is Aspidocilone, which from its etymology really should be a turtle. So I've depicted mine as a turtle, but if you remember the medieval depiction of the whale, it represents Satan. And of course I couldn't possibly make an evil sea turtle, that would be insane. So I've made mine living in peace and cooperation with people because how cool would that be? And then my other example here, the Hercinia, is a bird with feathers that glow uh, so that it lights the way for travelers lost in dark forests. And I like the idea of this creature just as it is. So my only twist here was in making my illustration much more detailed than those that appear in the bestiaries. I also included creatures from folklore all around the world, not just animals that appear in medieval European bestiaries, because I think it's really important to embrace and celebrate 
the full breadth of human imagination as inclusively as possible. And again, really, the more, more the merrier, right? I do just want to acknowledge that taking creatures from other cultures and then telling my own stories about them leaves me in that tension between inclusion and appropriation. I tried very hard not to include any creatures that figure in sacred stories rather than folklore and to be respectful in my retellings. Also, there are notes at the end of the book, um, but ultimately I felt that inclusion was most important. This is a topic that is worth multiple panels and has had multiple panels of its own. And I, I don't wanna make it the focus here, but I did just want to acknowledge that really complicated, difficult balancing act between not appropriating, but still being inclusive. So this is where I came down for this project. And I included a few creatures of my own invention. Some like this Lilith down here are creatures I had imagined before for other books that I've written. Um, some like these Jamatonians are creatures I invented specifically for this project, which was published with a Kickstarter campaign. And so um, the top tier the top tier for just two people was that I would make a creature based on their suggestions. So the Jamatonians and this the Grand Marhout um, came from that piece of the project. But I didn't just want to make entertaining pictures. Part of what I wanted to do with this project was to give my bestiary that allegorical moral dimension that the medieval bestiaries have but I wanted to draw moral lessons for the 21st century, not the 12th. I am certainly not a medieval Catholic. And another aspect of bestiaries is that they were definitely of their time and culture. And despite all that I love about them, they definitely reflected some of the uglier aspects of their time as well. There's anti-Semitism, misogyny, racism, cruelty to animals, casual violence to pretty much everyone. The virulence of the anti-Semitism or misogyny varied from bestiary to bestiary based on the particular agenda of each particular writer. Some are not as bad as others, but they all include a certain amount of content that is distasteful at best and sometimes downright appalling. So I wanted to make a medium to take a medium with so much going for it, the fascinating creatures, the wonderful stories, the beautiful illuminations, the deeper meanings, and use it for more uplifting, inclusive lessons that I believe in, reminders about the importance of respecting nature, not being greedy, um, welcoming others, being kind, not being afraid to be silly sometimes, the sorts of things I think we can all stand to be reminded of from time to time. And the sorts of things I think speculative fiction is uniquely equipped to remind us of because of its ability to say, stop worrying about you know realism and just imagine what might be possible. So that's the deep dive into my inspiration from the medieval bestiaries and how I've used that inspiration and adapted it into something with a little bit of a new twist. So um, if anyone has any questions now, I, I could take a minute and answer some now. Um, I don't see any at the moment. So I wanna read you a few excerpts from the book to show you sort of how this all got um, adapted into my, into my version. Oh, no, let's start here. I'm gonna read to you about the Umbrellaphant, which is the top left creature there. The Umbrellaphant is a beast native to the rainy regions of the world. And there are three species, the tusk umbled, the trunk umbled and the oracle umbled, depending upon where the broad parasols of their umbels grow. All three species use their umbels not only to protect their heads from excessive rain or sun, but also to slow their descent when they leap from high places. Truly, it is a marvelous sight to witness a herd of umbrellaphants floating from a mountaintop, appearing as light as dandelion down, 
until they reach the bottom and the ground shakes with their impact and the puddles splash in fountains beneath their massive feet. Not only for themselves do the umbrellaphants extend their umbles, however, for they are most welcoming beasts. Should another creature desire refuge, the umbrellaphant will gladly make room so that it is not uncommon to see a number of smaller birds and beasts accompanying an umbrellaphant pleased to find shade from the searing sun or shelter from the pelting rain. The ancient writer says, when caught by a shower, forgetting all fears, they stand underneath the umbrellaphant's ears. From the umbrellaphant, we can learn the importance of welcome and of making others feel accepted. Perhaps it is most especially important to welcome those who are not just like ourselves, for an umbrellaphant's shelter is of far greater importance to creatures who have no umbles of their own, and a kind and welcoming word is of most importance to the stranger. I do see a couple of questions here, so let me have a look. Ah, well, one question is whether the book is available for sale, um, and the answer is yes, and it can be obtained on, on Amazon or directly from me. And if you have free shipping on Amazon or buy it from me, but I have to charge you shipping, it will come out about the same either way. So whatever, <laughs> if you want it like autographed or something, you can get it from me. Um, and then um, another question is about whether the Sanaja was meant to be a snow leopard. And uh, I don't know, as I said, because I, I can't actually read the Arabic. So the amazing thing about the research I've been doing, I just have to, you know, gush about this, is how many medieval manuscripts are digitized and available online these days. Um, I, I um, looked through literally over a hundred medieval manuscripts um, that are digitized in their entirety um, through major libraries all around the world. And, um, with the European ones that are, uh, a lot of them are in Latin and I'm not exactly a Latin scholar, but I can kind of make out a lot of that. <laughs> but with the Arabic, I'm just, I, I don't, I can't make out a thing. So the answer to your question is I have absolutely no idea, but that seems like a very plausible guess. <laughs> um, some of the, um, some of these medieval bestiaries are also, there are versions in like medieval French, medieval, you know, uh, Middle English. Um, there's uh, a number of versions that are in like 14th, 15th, 16th century Dutch, especially the printed ones. Um, they got, um, there are some Dutch versions that were popular in some of the early printed books. So depending on what languages you're able to make out, you may be able to learn more about some of these creatures than others. Ah, all right. So the next question is, what is the lesson of the Epitril? So I will read you of the Epitril. The Epitril is a truly ridiculous beast, appearing to be composed of what random features were pulled from the hat of a careless creator and let loose into the realms of imagination without any particular skills or properties beyond its ungainly appearance. Even its name is a ridiculous looking word. The ancient writers recount no tales of the Epitril, no doubt finding it too silly to be worthy of their consideration. It would be easy to scoff at the Epitril, dismiss it as useless and sneer at its foolish features. But if we look more closely, we may notice that the Epitril itself seems perfectly pleased to be here. It cares not for the scorn of the world, neither allowing itself to be saddened by derision nor striking back in bitterness at those who mock it. The Epitril is quite content knowing it has its place in the world, even without praise or acclaim. Just as the Epitril is treated by small-minded people, so are all manner of creative ideas. The world may shower great praise upon a successful idea, but it is discouragingly critical of silly ideas despite the crucial fact that one seldom imagines great things without imagining many silly things first. From the Epitril, therefore, we learn that the imagination must never fear to be ridiculous. A thousand absurd ideas are a necessary part of the process of populating the realms of imagination, 
so that truly silliness can be as valuable in its turn as the more practical ideas which it may help to inspire and evolve. So according to my timekeeping, I probably have a few more minutes. So I can read you one more creature if you would like, or I can, let's do, let's do this. This is the Ninkinanka. On my page in my book. I did uh, reference my, I don't know how to do. Well, okay. So let me read this. Of the Ninkinanka. The Ninkinanka is a fearsome monster dwelling in the swamps and rivers of Western Africa, especially the Gambia and Senegal. Although it is seldom seen, its presence is known, and children are warned never to enter the swamps alone, lest the Ninkinanka devour them. Imagine how easily even a huge beast can lurk in the muddy pools among the roots and weeds, watching and waiting for unwary prey. A swirl of movement in the humid, heavy air, a swish of the turbid water, and suddenly the scaly neck rears up, the horns slash, the powerful teeth clamp on flesh, and another victim disappears beneath the churning water. Surely no one should enter the swamp without being warned of the Ninkinanka. The world is full of dangers, and every child must learn to face them. Some risks are necessary and help us stretch our abilities and strive toward our dreams, but other risks are foolish and unhealthy, leading us to excessive and purposeless danger. Everyone must learn to, distinct, to discern between the two, and the Ninkinaka therefore signifies the hope that all parents have for their growing children. Don't do anything stupid. So here are um, my website, nightandprints.com is down at the bottom. I have a table or a, a channel in Discord. I have a table in Gather. I have uh, stuff in the art show. So if you check out the art show, you can see stuff there. Um, um, the question is back to, if you go to my website, my website does not have like, um, uh, a cart where you can do direct checkout, but you can contact me through the website and, and then I send you a, um, uh, an invoice, a square invoice that can be paid like online as if it were a cart. So there's just that one extra step in there. Um, I'm not sure whether, um, I think that is everything of the questions. So um, I have, oh, uh, here's the other thing I want to put in plugs for. Um, at four o'clock today, I'm doing a reading from a completely different and unrelated book for kids called Kate and Sam to the Rescue in the, in the reading room. And then on Sunday at 1130, I'm doing a reading from another different book called The Extraordinary Book of Doors, which is a middle grade fantasy um, adventure, in addition to, to a couple of panels. Uh, and then this art demo at four tomorrow. So I got all kinds of other stuff going on. So I would be more than happy to um, have any of you back. Um, and as I said, I will go to the, um, to the Discord channel for this room, which is St. George. Um, and then um, answer any other questions or chat with people there. So thank you so much for coming and, um, and joining me about one of these things that I just get super excited about. And I love to see if I can get other people excited about it too. So thank you.